The final one I want to talk about is how else we could change the, scene, uh, the job of a senior crime officer. And this is an interesting question. And for me, this is a thing that I've recently got interested in, maybe in the last three, four years, thinking the biggest problem with a senior crime officer is the fact that the officer has to go into the scene of the crime in order to identify anything. <clears throat> so that could lead to contamination, which has a huge effect. That could lead to the officer themselves being contaminated. A classic example of this was in the Salisbury poisonings. In fact, it was the, the police officer who went into the house of the Scripples, who became the most one of the most affected by, or because he was in hospital for so long, because he entered the scene of crime and he actually handled the material. He handed the doorknob where it was. He then brushed his face and put and rubbed his eyes. And that, that was what actually caused him to get infected and take this in. Now, obviously he wasn't, because he wasn't expecting it to be a crime scene. He wasn't wearing full protective kit like these people in the, phot the photograph are. But still that problem exists that currently senior crime officers enter a scene often without any knowledge of exactly what's going in there and without able to prepare and potentially contaminating or causing other issues. So I asked the question, what if we could replace a senior crime officer, a soccer, with a drone? And we're doing this. We're working, and this is quite an old photo of an old drone that we had, in fact, it's an old stock photo, by actually looking at putting instrumentation onto drones in order to fly them as a first port of call within crimes into a crime scene so we can get rapid real-time non-intrusive access to crime scenes you no longer have someone walking in or touching surfaces you can have something which is much more controlled actually passing through a crime scene and identifying the particular things that we're interested in and we do this by not only going in and having visible cameras on there we do this by putting a whole variety of different sensors onto the drone in order to be able to, to identify what's in there. And that comes back to what I've talked about before, because we care about <coughs> being able to look at these things, but a drone is reliant on, has a battery life. And if we want to put heavy bits of kit on there, that battery life isn't going to last very long. So we have a problem. So it comes back to before about actually wanting to reduce and miniaturize things a bit in order to study it. And we do this for a actually a different thing in order to study um, and gather information. One of the primary ones for another um, project that we work on with, um, in fact, I currently have um, one project student, so one third year student working, um, one final year student doing his, in fact, master's because he was on our full, full year forensic course, actually working on this now with my PhD student in my group. Um, and we're actually interested in doing this, not only for looking at crime scenes, but also for looking at cows. So here it is. In fact, here is a drone on a farm. And we built, if you can see on the screen, we started to build from raspberry pies and various other things, um, essentially a sensor set that we can strap to the bottom of the drone that's lightweight and low powered, but can then be used to focus and gather information. And we were first off, we were interested in thermal information. We were interested in um, finding out things for the interest, interest of cows, we were finding out, interested in finding out whether or not a cow was sick, because this is the same idea of shrinking technology down, like Katrina Kromoff was interested, but we also know that to go back to thinking about why do we care about, care about cows being sick? We care about them, because if there's an outbreak of a disease on a farm, suddenly the farmer doesn't want to cull all of those cows, he wants to be able to identify very quickly. In fact, we've got a very relevant thing for now, where if any of you have been over the summer, went through any airports during the, the pandemic, <coughs> you would have found that you walked past a load of thermal cameras, which would have been used to try and identify whether people had an elevated temperature. Now, we're trying to do exactly the same thing, but with cows. Which comes back to my favourite question. Where is the best place to take now, I haven't got a quiz for this, but I do want to you at home to discuss with your, your parents or your friends, whoever you've got, where's the best taste to take a temperature on the cow? Now, I wonder how many of you are, are saying this because this is well known that the best place to take a temperature on a cow is its bum, because that's what we see. That's where vets always seem to take a temperature. In fact, 
I mean, I don't really know why vets do that. That's not the best place to take the temperature of a cow. Well, I do know why they do it. But actually, there's a lot of error in this. That is not the best place to take a temperature. In fact, the best place to take a temperature on a cow is in its eye. <coughs> in fact, here's a thermal image of a cow. And you can see the, the kind of more white the image is, the, the, the hotter it is. You can see around the eye, in fact, specifically in the corner of the eye, is one of the hottest places on the now. And that's the best place to take a temperature repliably and repeatedly on a cow. So in order to do this, we've taken all of our techniques. We've taken physics, we've taken chemistry, we've looked at biology and then an engineering thing. And we had to bring in our, our last tool in order to do this, which is computing. So we're working with computing experts in our department. We've got um, Dr. Stuart Gibson, who was our mission officer, admissions officer I mentioned at the start. He is also, a, he's, he, he designs and works on a lot of machine learning and computational diagnostics for forensic uses, as well as being involved and in, he has his own spin out company, which was used for the analysis of, um, for, for, for using for eFit software that a lot of our police forces use across the country. And he's a, a computing expert. So working with him and some colleagues, we're actually looking at doing something I thought I would never say, which is facial recognition for cows. So that when we have a cow, not only can we identify the cow, and identify its face, but we can also identify the features of the cow's face and look at the corner of a cow's eye and use that to actually specifically identify um, that and then take a temperature from it from a thermal perspective. And here it is. In fact, I've got an image on screen here. There's, here is an image of a drone, one of our drones with those cameras on. In fact, it's an image of our drones, one of those drones filmed from another drone, because why not? Why don't we have one drone and then film it from another drone? And there it is with all the, those on in a field in Scotland. In fact, this was on a farm in Scotland. Now let's look at what those, those, that drone looks like. This is the thermal camera <coughs> on that drone. And you can see, in fact, you can see in the background there, you can see there's some cows, there's very hot objects. And you can see us waving there and you can see the identify the different features of our heat maps <coughs> on us. So we've actually developed a technology that can be done on a drone for identifying lightweight imaging technology, which before, is in, incidentally, would take up the size of a, of a room, um, to be able to start deploying it with the right wavelengths on a surface. 